They both want to know about the stack. What is it? How do you make it happen? What's going on? This is probably the most important question I will answer ever. So, you know, if like you are sick of me and you're like, I'm going to stop listening to you, this would be the debrief to do it. What is the stack? Why is it important? If we're talking about restoring movement options, to me, the stack is the most important thing to coach. Also, too, I would argue if you're trying to move some big weight, you want to move well in the gym and on the field, you probably need to have this mastered. What the stack entails is putting the pelvic diaphragm and the thoracic diaphragm relatively on top of one another. What this is going to do is it's going to allow for the respiratory mechanism. When you breathe in, both diaphragms will descend and expand the ventral cavity in all directions. When you breathe out, both diaphragms will ascend and compress the ventral cavity in all directions. That's going to allow for adequate development of both intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure. It will give you the potential to have all of your movement options available within the ventral cavity and many other good things. That's why it's super important because most people, if they have some type of compensation going on, there is likely a loss of that respiratory mechanism for a wide variety of reasons. The stack is the first step in improving those dynamics. What that will entail, more often than not, is a posterior tilt of the pelvis, because with most compensatory scenarios, there's an anterior tilt or orientation of the pelvis. That's going to change the, the the position of the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm and is not going to allow for an effective stack. In the terms of the thoracic diaphragm, with most compensatory situations, the diaphragm is going to be more descended, albeit to varying degrees depending on if you're a wide or a narrow infrasternal angle. A wide infrasternal angle is going to have less of a descended diaphragm compared to a narrow but both will be descended if there is going to be if there is a loss of movement present. So we need to do things to ascend the diaphragm to the nth degree. That's why I coach the snot out of a full exhalation. What that does is it drops the lower rib cage down, which a lot of times you'll see the ribs flared out on folks who have a loss of movement. It'll drop the lower rib cage down allow the diaphragm to fully ascend and get your diaphragms in a stack position so you have all of your movement available to you. That's why the stack is important and that's why of course if you can't stack I say don't talk to Zach but from my standpoint that's going to make me really lonely because a lot of people have a hard time coaching and performing the stack. This is like my job is to teach people to stack. I want to talk to you folks so I'm going to teach you how to do it. First thing, I start with a posterior pelvic tilt of some sort. The way I coach it depends on which infrasternal angle presentation you have and if you have primary or secondary compensations. Let's say you're a wide infrasternal angle. More often than not, I teach the stack in the side-lying position for reasons I had mentioned previously. The way I coach it is a few different things. And there's a, I have a sideline tilt progression and a hook line tilt progression. I'll link those in the show notes because that will give you a nice overview of um, how to do it. But what I coach is some type of posterior tilt in sideline, cues that I like. And this is true regardless of infrasternal angle presentation. I'll either say pull your belt buckle to your belly button. I will say... Imagine someone's pulling you by the back pockets towards your knees or your heels. I like, this is one I like a lot, squish your butt flap to your thigh. Or if those three don't work, I will actually have the client, I'll say, arch your back, pretend you're Jennifer Lopez or Kim Kardashian, whoever you prefer. Personally, I prefer Jennifer Lopez because I had a crush on her as a kid. But Jennifer Lopez, now I want you to 
unjlo yourself or pretend you're Michael Jackson and go the opposite direction. That can be a very useful cue for anyone. If they can't get into the position you want, have them go the exact opposite direction, and then that will give them context of where to go in the opposite direction, and, and that can be a really useful cue. Generally, those four cues will work. If they don't, then either the position is too challenging and you need to go with something else. So in the case of a, a wide who's in sideline, maybe you need to do a manual technique where you really drive the knees up towards the chest. That could be a really useful way of getting it. Or you do some type of passive tilt where that might be actually putting them in supine uh, either hook lying or in the lewit position, and put something underneath their sacrum so they create a passive tilt. MCI Cicerone 1, in regards to the side lying position, do I put feet on the wall for reference with side lying? Yes, I do. Thank you for saying that. So with the side lying tilt, and I usually do this at about 60 degrees of hip flexion, and that's because that will aid in sacral counter nutation. I will have the feet up against the wall. And the first part for a wide is to get the tuck however you coach it. Now, the issue with side lying is you don't necessarily get good hamstring and glute recruitment just tucking in that position. So I will have them, after they get the tuck really well, push their feet into the wall. That can allow them to get the glute and hamstring recruitment that we desire. Once you have that, then what you're going to do is have them hold that position and breathe in that position. With the exhale, you want them to get as much air out as humanly possible. The goal is to get the diaphragm to ascend. If they can't get the diaphragm to ascend all the way because the exhale is short, you're not going to get the stacked position. You're not going to get the movement options that you need to restore. So, you want to get a full exhale out for a wide infrasternal angle. Because you're trying to close the rib cage, you want to make the angle smaller. I go with a like a, a pursed lipped or a kissy face. I always go like your duck face on IG or you're flickering a candle. Have them exhale that way. Because what that's going to do is it's going to create a little bit of resistance which will encourage more superficial musculature activity, especially external obliques. You need that for a wide because you're trying to close that angle, so you need more tension in the abdominal area. But you still want the exhale to be slow. So that's your other piece. Once you get that full exhale, you want to draw attention to them and say, hey, are you feeling a little bit of ab tension when you do that? And a lot of them will say, well, yeah, Zach, I am feeling some ab tension. That's wonderful. If they're not, they just might not have that sensory awareness. So what you can do is have them put their hands on their abs and use that as a way to develop that sensation. Maybe they're just not getting a full enough exhale to get the ab tension. In that case, what you can do is assist them manually by pressing down on the lower ribs gently during the exhale. Don't push too hard because it'll be uncomfortable. Once they get the sense of feeling that ab tension and they get a full exhalation, then what you want to do is teach them to maintain that tension during a pause, three to five seconds. That's going to get them used to sustaining that ab tension, which is needed during the subsequent inhale. Get the tension. Do you feel it? Yes, I do. Can you maintain it during a pause? Yes, or maybe they can't pause long because they feel like they're going to suffocate. That's okay. The reason why that happens is because they have low carbon dioxide tolerance. Just work on them improving their pause capabilities and holding that pause. Once they have that, then what you're going to do is encourage them to keep the ab tension during the inhalation, during the subsequent inhalation. Because what that's going to do is it's going to anchor the lower rib cage down so you can get circumferential expansion in the rib cage. Because if they can't keep the ab tension, what's going to happen is they're going to, going to either belly breathe, more often than not with the wide, 
meaning that they're not going to get any expansion in the upper thorax, or they're going to lift the thorax up as a unit by utilizing accessory musculature. If that happens, you're not going to get expansion in the upper rib cage. So either of those are problematic, and we don't want that. That's for a wide infrasternal angle. Start with sideline to get the tuck and the tilt. Coach the breathing the way we talked about, and you should be in business. Now, if you have someone who's wide and they have a secondary compensation, sideline can still be useful, but I've also found for those folks, um, teaching it in seated can also be quite useful just because it's easier to get a tuck. If you have a wide ISA who's just got the primary compensations, hook lying is a good position to start them in. If like side lying just isn't cutting it, maybe it hurts to lie on their sides and they are a wide with secondary compensations, then I would go with a Lewitt position or 90-90. So that's the wide. The narrow, the coaching and sequencing is very similar. What changes is a little bit of the exhalation and the positions that you start them in. If I have a narrow infrasternal angle, generally I will start them coaching the stack in supine as opposed to quadruped. And the reason why is because they can get better visual appraisal of what, what I'm doing or, or what I'm teaching them on how to do it. I'll start in the Lewitt position if it's a primary compensation, loss of extension adduction IR. If it's a secondary, they lost flexion abduction ER, I'll start them in hook line. Same cues, same cues for getting the tuck as the wide. The one thing that would change is if you're using the Lewitt position and they still really are struggle bus when it comes to tucking, you can have them dig their heels down onto a ledge or a cue that I like is pretend you got doggy do on your shoes and you're scraping it off the wall. Um, that can be really useful to help them get the tuck because they might not be able to generate enough tension with proximal hamstring distal glute. So you can use distal hamstring to get the tuck. It's not ideal always. So get that. Coach the exhalation the exact same way. The only difference is you're going to have an open mouth sigh. Like you're fogging a glass window or you took a drink of water. One of those. Both of those are useful. What you'll find with an issue is during the exhale with, with narrows is that they just won't open their mouth. So I'll say, take a big bite out of an elephant. Don't do that at home. Or I'll say, no, open your mouth, like really big open. Imagine I said something incredibly offensive and you're shocked. Sometimes that, those will work. But a lot of times you just have to keep reinforcing that over and over again. Another thing could be if you're too close, they might fear that they have bad breath and don't want... There's stanky breath all up in your grill. If that's the case, move away. And just say, hey, I'm going to move away. I want you to just get that open mouth exhale. They might be more comfortable with that. And then the process is the same. You're creating the ab tension with the full exhale. Hold that during the pause and then maintain it during the subsequent inhale. Now, a couple other specifics to consider for wides and narrows. In terms of what you're going to do with the legs... With a narrow, generally, if they have a primary compensation, you're going to adduct the legs together. So if they got a ball between the knees, I would squeeze that. And the reason why that is is because if you're adducting the legs, that's going to help pull the infrapubic angle apart, which a narrow ISA needs. Because if I have a narrow infrasternal angle, structurally, my infrapubic angle, this angle below the pubic symphysis, the IPA, the favorite kind that I like to drink, needs to be pulled apart. You don't want that with a wide ISA because their infrapubic angle is going to be wider. So for them, I will either hold a ball or something between the knees or put a band around the knees and create slight, slight amounts of external rotation. Those can be quite useful. If you have someone who's got a secondary compensation, scratch that. For a narrow ISA, I will just have them hold the ball in place. Or for a wide ISA, same thing. I won't drive any excessive AB or A deduction. Just keep everything in a straight line. 
that seems to be quite useful. And the reason why that is is because you're going to be changing the position that you're going to be placing the extremities in. So like for a narrow, if they have a secondary compensation and I'm utilizing hook lying to teach the stack, well, I don't want to adduct in that position. And the reason why that is is because the hook lying position is going to drive more counter nutation. There's a debrief where I dive deep into that, so check that out. I'll link it. So I don't necessarily want the squeeze there because then I have contradictory mechanics at play. Same thing with a wide. If I have a wide who's got a secondary compensation, I could actually put the hips at 90 degrees, but I don't necessarily want to squeeze because they still have the structurally wide infrapubic angle. So don't worry about getting fancy in that regard. And those would be the big keys when we're talking about stacking. In terms of compensations you may see, like how do I know? I get this a lot too. Zach, how do I know that their tuck is on point? A few things you can check. One, look at the abs. If they tuck, they should have minimal ab tension. If they're tensing their abs like gangbusters, they're not getting a good tuck. If you see the abdominal contents push outward during the tuck. They're not tucking because what's happening in that case is they're concentrically biasing their back and that's pushing the guts forward. We don't want those things. You want minimal abdominal movement during the tuck. So you might need to either finagle your cueing a bit, try something different, try a different position. Any of that can be useful for getting that. With the exhale, you can see the same compensations. In, at the abdominal region. Generally, that's because they're exhaling too quickly, so I will coach them to go softer, get as much air out as possible, get it all out. During the inhale, if they see a loss of ab tension, well, you'll see that either one of two ways. Either you'll have just this huge belly breath and nothing going on to the thorax, or you'll see a lot of neck tension kick in during the inhale. That means that they're not keeping adequate ab tension during the inhale, and you might reinforce that. And really, folks, if you can do those things, you're going to have a pretty good stack, and you will have permission to talk to Zach. To summarize, tuck first. Use whatever you need to be successful. For wides, I like starting in sideline. For narrows, I like starting in supine. You can manipulate leg position based on if they have primary or secondary compensations. For a wide, that would mean primary compensations would start at 60 degrees of hip flexion. If they had secondary, I would start them closer to 90. For narrows, I would start them at 90 degrees of hip flexion, the Lewitt position. If they have secondary compensations, I'd start them in hook line. Coach the exhale. Make sure the ab wall drops down during the exhalation. You want it to be slow, controlled, get as much air out as humanly possible. For wides, kissy face, wind impression, narrows, open mouth exhale. From there, you want to create ab tension with the exhale. You're not going to force it, but the exhale should create tension in the abs. You want to maintain that during a pause, during an inhale, and you can bet your bottom dollar that you won't fail.